from cold sensations and disembodied laughter to something possibly demonic. These are five real Japanese horror stories. I'm Fear Crawler. Welcome to the video. I'm glad this didn't just happen to me by myself, but was also experienced by my Japanese friend at the time. It was amazing and quite a shock to our systems. I had wanted to visit Takashima Castle on the shores of Lake Siwa in Nagano Prefecture, and finally drove there in late autumn of 2006. After getting lost on the way, my friend and I arrived at the small park with dungeon building and moat at around 6.30 p.m. It was dark, and the main building, which is now a museum reconstructed in the 1960s, was closed and locked up. I was a bit disappointed that I couldn't enter and check out the museum, but I was still happy to be there. I began fooling around, first climbing up the castle wall a little bit, ninja style, then proceeded up the stone flight of stairs to the locked doors of the main keep. I jokingly knocked on the door and gave the handle a tug. Yeah, it was locked. I went to get my keys out of my pocket once again jokingly, and as I did so, my friend took her high-heeled boots off and ran back down the stairs. Did you hear that? She yelled. I remember hearing some kind of sound from behind the door, but nothing that registered. I gingerly went to the bottom of the stairs and asked what was wrong. Then from the top of the stairs, coming from the inside of the keep, a man's laughter rang out. <laughs> we froze and looked at each other, not speaking. Then we looked back up at the door. It sounded like the voice of a 40-something-year-old Japanese man. Uh-oh, I thought as I waited for a security guy or a groundskeeper to come out and tell me off. But there was just laughter. I thought it was a bit odd. Thirty seconds passed, and as we gazed up at the door, suddenly from very close by, probably no more than three meters in front of me, and completely from thin air on the stairs, again we heard loudly. <laughs> Adrenaline kicked in and I grabbed my friend and told her to run. We ran on jelly legs in the opposite direction. My friend almost in tears from the fright. Guminasai, I'm sorry, I said aloud in a shaky voice as we passed through a gate out over the moat bridge. Then as we stopped for a breath, once more, seemingly from the top of a window, there was another burst of laughter. <laughs> I was glad that he or it hadn't followed us. But my friend was pretty scared, and so was I. We got back to the car and we drove off with a memory that we'd never forget. As for me, I now have more respect for old sites full of bloody and violent history. This happened in the summer of 2012. It was a good time for walking or biking in Japan, because in winter, you can't just get out of the house, especially when the snow is about five meters thick at our place. I was working at a construction company not far from my apartment. If you were to drive there, it would be about five or seven minutes just because it was summer. But using my mountain bike, it usually took around 20 or 30 minutes to get from work to my place. I always took the most populated road. That way there was less danger and I could see the road more clearly. Mostly when going home, I would be with my co-worker Kenji, because his girlfriend was residing in the building next to my apartment. One time when we were traveling together, he suggested that we take a shortcut and use a route that would cross the river of Kaminokawa. There really wasn't much light there, because the light posts were very far apart. There was a part there that would take around 5 minutes to cross, because you only had moonlight to guide you on your path, but by taking the shortcut, it would reduce the travel time from 30 minutes to about 20 minutes. One time Kenji got really sick and had to take leave for two weeks, and since he wasn't traveling with me, I decided to use the normal road once again. 
My girlfriend from Tokyo messaged me that she would be staying at my apartment for a week, which meant for that week I would have to hurry home each night to see how she was doing. So, because I wanted to reduce the travel time each night, I started taking the shortcut again. On my second day of taking this shortcut by myself, I saw a person dressed in all white. She had long hair that went down to her waist, and she was facing the river. She was sitting on a bench with a light post near the dark spot of the road. Because I was in a hurry, I didn't really pay much attention to her. The following day, I saw her again. It was around 8 p.m., only this time she was standing on the railings in front of the river, so naturally I couldn't help but wonder what this girl was doing here alone. I didn't know who she was, and really in Japan we have a pretty low crime rate, and that's why I was fairly comfortable that she was safe, so I decided not to go near her. On the third night she wasn't near the bench anymore, but I saw her standing in the middle of a dark spot on the road, once again standing on the railings facing the river. Because it was very dark where she was standing, I decided to approach her and ask her what she was doing there, and to try to warn her to be more careful. When I was around 10 meters away, I shouted to her, Konbanwa, which is how you greet people at night. It seemed like she didn't hear me, so I got closer. When I was around 2 meters away, I noticed that she was not on the road side of the railing, she was actually on the other side. I couldn't help but notice the way she was standing. When I finally got a clear look at her, I could see that she wasn't standing on anything at all. She was floating above the river, and her hair was moving, even though there wasn't any wind blowing at the time. At this point, all the hair on my body began to stand on end. I quickly turned back without knowing what was happening. My body was automatically responding to what I was visualizing at that moment. I couldn't focus on pedaling my bike, and that's why I decided to just push it while I was running. During my run, I took a glimpse back at her, and I saw her slowly begin to turn around and look at me. It was so dark, and the next light post was around 40 meters away from me. I ran as fast as I could without bothering to look back, because I was terrified she was right behind me. Even though I was getting closer to the light post, it still felt like it was a hundred miles away. I finally felt a bit safer as a car approached, and its headlights lit up the road. I couldn't see the girl anymore. I told this story to Kenji, and we decided that we were not going to take that road again. It was later that we learned that the spot where I'd seen the girl was actually the site of a deadly accident. A while back, a 17-year-old girl was hit by a car in that exact same spot that I saw that girl. When I was young, I was able to sense the presence of spirits. As I got older, my senses seemed to heighten, and it got to where I could distinguish whether it was a male or a female, a child or an adult. It's now gotten to where I can actually see them, Sometimes they're shadows, mists, or a glow, while others are just as real as anyone else. Right now, I live in Okinawa, Japan. I moved here in April of 2010. My family calls this a gift, but at times it's real fear. I've been trying to control what I allow myself to see and feel, but that hasn't been easy. There is so much activity on this island that at times it's difficult to filter what's actually there and what's not. I have three experiences that will stay with me forever. The first time I arrived here, my husband was driving past a military area, which made me feel very uncomfortable. After I had that feeling, I saw a Japanese male walking along the road in front of us. Something about him was unsettling. I could feel it in my gut and under my skin. To me, the way he was walking didn't seem that he was touching the ground. Twice, it looked like he increased in size, only to then shrink back down to regular size. After seeing this, I couldn't take my eyes off of him. It was towards the evening, just before dark, 
There was a light glow with some pink and purple in the sky. As we drove closer, he started to fade away. We got to the point where I'd last seen him, and I started looking around with no sign of him anywhere. My husband asked what was wrong. I explained to him that I didn't like the feeling the area was giving me, and what I saw. He then explained to me about the area, and the stories that were connected to it. Unfortunately, I can't share most of the details due to it being a military base. He told me that it was an old munition storage, and that there were some deaths involved. Sounds of guns and explosions in the distance where there shouldn't be any. Apparently there were times where guards would see old Japanese soldiers geared up for battle, and upon being approached, they would disappear. For all I know, what I was seeing that evening could have been a Japanese soldier back in 1945. My second encounter was here in my own home. I live in what the Japanese call a mansion, but it's actually an apartment, American style. For several nights whenever I'd wake up to go to the bathroom, I felt someone watching me from the spare bedroom. Night after night this continued. The room always felt stuffy and dark. I went into the room one night to confront whatever was in there. My entire body started to tingle and I felt almost empty. I had to get out of that room and I went right back to bed. That night I slept close to my husband. The third time I was home alone. My husband was working the night shift. I was asleep when noises at the foot of my bed woke me up. It was the sound of crinkling paper. I laid in bed listening to it, and then it stopped. We didn't own any animals at the time, so I'll admit that I was scared. After that I felt a presence. It felt like a child pacing back and forth from the foot of my bed to the side of the bed that I was sleeping on. My body started getting the chills, and I started feeling sick to my stomach. The only other way I can describe it was the feeling of being hung over. I covered my head and I fell back to sleep, but not for long. I woke up to what I thought was my husband finally home from work, and my nerves could finally settle down. I could hear his boots on the tile floor, walking from the door to the office, but he never came to the room. I thought he wasn't tired yet and he probably went into the office to play on the computer, so I fell back asleep. I woke up to the floor creak at our bedroom door. Half asleep, I was thinking it was my husband finally coming to bed. As his presence got closer to the bed and leaned over me, I knew it wasn't him. All I could do was lay in bed with this thing staring at me, inches away from my face. I imagined myself grabbing its hair and pushing it away from me. After a few moments which felt like hours, my heart stopped racing, but I was still scared. I mustered up the courage to get out of bed to tell my husband what happened and to come to bed. I got up and the place was dark. I wondered if he had stepped out, but there was no evidence of him ever being home. I slept light for the rest of the night, with the TV on, and heard the front door open. This time I yelled out my husband's name to make sure it was him. Thank God it was. I didn't know how much more I could have taken. I told him about my experience and we decided to get a cat, and I was going to smudge the house in the morning. When I woke up I was angry about what these spirits had put me through. I smudged our home, fed up, and I was basically yelling at them to get out. In my tradition cats can see spirits, and they will protect those that they love. We now own two cats. Since that day, I haven't had any encounters in my home anymore. But outside is another story. Last year, me and my brother were fishing about four kilometers off the coast of Okinawa. It seemed like a good day to go fishing. Fairly calm waters and lots of fish. This was the last day of my holiday in Japan, 
I was flying back home the next day, so I wanted to make it worth it. After about three hours, we had caught about 40 kilograms of fish, and it was starting to get dark. My brother told me to pull the ripcord to the motor, but it wouldn't budge. It was then that I heard the faint sound of a propeller engine, but I dismissed it as a passing light aircraft or something like that. The sound got louder, and this transparent dark green plane with crimson circles under its wings passed over, accompanied by a cold wind that sent a chill throughout my body. The plane then banked left, and it hit the water. My brother pulled the motor cord and the engine miraculously came back to life. He then steered the boat to the supposed crash site of the plane. There was nothing there except a large ray swimming near the surface. And then this weird whispering started. It sounded like Japanese, but I wasn't sure. I was worried. I had never had any experiences with the paranormal before, so I didn't know what to do. And that's when the boat's outboard motor stopped, and the whispering started to sound hostile. My brother and I were terrified. It sounded like they didn't want us there. Then without warning, the motor roared back to life, and we managed to get the boat back to land without any further issues. I'm still very scared about this experience but I haven't had any issues like this since. I found out that a suicide plane was shot down in that area in 1945, and its ghost is believed to appear on the anniversary of the crash. The year was 1978, and I was 15 years old. My best friend had returned to Japan after spending a year attending our junior high school in the States while her father was a visiting professor at the local university. I missed her terribly after she had gone, and was able to persuade my grandfather to send me to Japan to visit her during the coming summer. I arrived on July evening, completely exhausted of course, yet terribly excited. My friend and her mother showed me to my room, which was the only traditional Japanese room in the house, one with tatami matting and sliding doors. This is a feature common to fairly affluent homes in Japan. Modern construction and conveniences for the majority of the house, with one traditional Japanese room. I recall that when her mother opened the corner closet to retrieve the futon mats that would be my bed, a cold chill emanated from it. I thought nothing of it. Of course, an enclosed space would be less affected by the ambient temperatures of a room. I slept very soundly that first night. The following night after I retired, I lay awake, listening to the sounds of the house as it was winding down for the evening. I heard light switches click off and bedroom doors upstairs closing. I was imagining what new adventures we might have tomorrow. I then began to hear a faint laughter. <laughs> it seemed to be coming from perhaps the neighboring house. Perhaps there was a little get-together over there. Then the laughter became louder. <laughs> and then the laughter became closer. <laughs> and then the laughter sounded menacing. <laughs> it was a decidedly evil man's laughter, which now closed in around my ears, growing louder and louder. I thought, hey, just get up and go upstairs and get your friend. I was wide awake. I tried to do just that, only to find that I couldn't move. Not a muscle. My instinct and unusual spiritual training for a young person had kicked in. I had practiced yoga since I was a young child and just before leaving. My yoga instructor had mentioned something about an East Indian holy man named Ramana. The mere mention of his name dispelled negative energies. I tried to say his name aloud. I was ready to try anything. To my horror, I discovered that I also could not speak. Fear freezes, my instinct told me. What I have to do in the midst of the terror is to try and relax. I began to imagine myself floating through a starry night sky. A calm in the midst of this storm around me came over me. 
I tried to speak the name of the holy man again, and this time I was able to mouth the word, even though no sound came out. Ramana. As I did so, it was as if a switch had been turned off. The evil laughter which had become deafening around my ears had stopped. I was able to move, and I considered running upstairs to my friend. Yet somehow, I knew that I was safe now, so I thought it best not to wake her. The following day, a number of my friend's friends had come over for a welcoming tea. I told the story of what had happened to me. They replied, yes, that was Kanashibari, they told me quite matter-of-factly, which means, wrapped in bandages. It was a common thing which occurs in Japan, whereby some spirit or another who happens to be running about decides to have a bit of fun with a resting human. They proceeded to tell me other tales of spirits, both playful and malevolent, who specialized in turning children around in their beds, so that their head would be where their feet had been when they awoke. They were not surprised in the least by my experience, and had no trouble in believing that I had indeed been awake, and that this was no dream. The entity was likely a demonic one, judging from my description, they said, and I imagine that anyone who had heard that laughter would have concurred. The direction from where the laughter had originated, I realized, had been the bedding closet, which had emanated that chilly draft from the night before. I took from that experience the notion that calm in the presence of malevolent entities is a powerful strategy. Indeed, my later studies in martial arts would serve to underscore that conclusion. Don't strike when you're angry, I once heard a Tibetan monk remark. You might miss. That's all for today's video. I do hope you enjoyed these stories. Until next time, everyone take care, be safe, and above all, stay scared.